So if it takes a couple of minutes to bring everyone in, um, we'll just uh, just a bit of general chit chat uh, whilst uh, whilst the one or two minutes pass. Jim, you have changed location. Where are you? I'm up at uh, Kilcare. For those of you who don't know where Kilcare is, it's on the central coast, um, somewhere out of Gosford, Woy Woy, Hardy's Bay is uh, on the, the bay side, and Kilcare is on the seaside. So if it wasn't dark, we could look to my left straight out at the ocean. And on a, on a uh, little a domestic few, holiday? Uh, hmm? A oh, domestic my, holiday? My friends have both said I've been on a holiday for 45 years, but um, <laughs> it's a bit harsh. But yeah, I'm just having a little break away from it all while, while the weather's good. I mean, uh, the weather is uh, unbelievable during the day. Oh, yeah. as, as anyone who's living close to Sydney would know, and it's going to be that way for another week. So. Ah, one I don't see, and see what's what. And your uh, your birthday celebrations last month. We did this on your birthday last month. How uh, how did it go once we turned the webcam off? Um, well, um, it happened before actually. We had the big show. The <laughs> right, great. Whether the social distancing restrictions and managed to squeeze a few people inside and uh, didn't upset the neighbours or anyone else. So yes. <laughs> Um, perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Where well, you're looking? I was nursing a, 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 hang, a hangover of sorts when I was speaking to you last time. I um, refuse to accept it. No one would have noticed. Cause not always. Not always. So there you are. <laughs> yeah. um, let's uh, let's get the ball rolling because I reckon most people would have been brought in now, and this is a really exciting one tonight. This monthly webinar series uh, brought to you by the Primary Club of Australia. We've been doing this since the world went into lockdown, and I think it feels like, based on the success of them and the people we've been able to chat to, it's going to be something we do well into the future, even when we can get out and about, because it's such an easy way to sit and chat to some amazing people. And tonight is no exception. A huge thank you to our series sponsors, Vocus Communication, bringing the technology of this webinar series together, and Equinix, who specialise in internet connection and data centres. And a huge welcome to our two guests. We'll start with Alex Blackwell, former Australian captain, Primary Club Ambassador, welcome and thank you for being a part of it. Thanks, Matt. I mean, with the guest tonight, a teammate of mine, I couldn't say no, really, a chance to have a bit of banter. And also um, a colleague with Jim as well, now working a little bit with ABC. So, yeah. And of course, the Primary Club, I love what they do. So any chance I can help. Oh, well, it's going to be fantastic. And the uh, person who you'll be joining this evening is Without hesitation, the biggest uh, coup we've been able to accrue since we've been doing this, which is aligning one of these webinars with the ICC Hall of Fame, the newest member of the Hall of Fame, a former Australian captain, a primary club ambassador, Lisa Stalaker. Welcome and congratulations. Thank you very much, Matt. And good to see you all, Alex and Jim. It's nice to actually see the cricket community because uh, we've kind of been starved of it. So it's nice to see all your friendly faces. How was the how was the day when you when you got told you were being inducted when the world found out? How was it? Yeah, I actually found out probably a few months ago, um, so I've had to sit on it for a while. Uh, but uh, when it was announced on Sunday night, um, in my phone, you know, the amount of messages, um, the the support I got from around the world, I was blown away by it. Um, the fact that so many former teammates, former coaches. Uh, selectors, fans, um, it, it was really nice. And, and probably in this pandemic, it was nice to get a little bit of love because I'm here all by myself. <laughs> Where are you? I'm in Sydney, but uh, home alone. And I was planning to, to work a fair bit these last four months with the IPL, uh, the Olympics, uh, and then the, the mm. CPL, even though that's gone, gone ahead. But uh, yeah, they've uh, cut down on staff, as I'm sure things will always be tough as we kind of come out of this pandemic. Yeah, no doubt. Well, um, we're plenty to discuss around all of that. Um, if this is the first time you've jumped on board and just based on the, the, the Twitter and Instagram interactions in advance, there's people from all over the world who, who have come here to see you guys have a chat and, and hear what you have to say. Um, what the Primary Club is, very simple, providing sporting and recreational facilities for people with a disability. The way we do that, two ways. One, we ask you to sign up as a member or renew your membership. It's $50 a year to join the Primary Club. And a big thank you to those who are a part. Uh, and of course, 
the auction, which are proving phenomenally popular and very competitive, where these two guys bring something to the table that you just simply cannot get anywhere else. So let's find out who, uh, what it is we're going to be auctioning this evening. Mm. Lisa, let's start with you. What are you bringing to the auction table this evening? Well, it's something unique. Um, basically, uh, during a, an ICC event, you'll get a towel for the tournament. And then when you make the finals, as you can see, uh, <laughs> you get your own towel with your name on it. Uh, this was 2012, the T20 World Cup, where Australia went on to win that, um, that World Cup. So uh, there's what, 15, Alex, 15 towels that are produced uh, for each side. So this is one of 30, but obviously one, only one off with my name. Yeah, amazing. You didn't amazing. shower after that match then, Lisa? No, remember we... we We're got, not celebrating. Not enough time for that. Alex, we got straight on the plane, remember? <laughs> no, no, I don't. <laughs> Sign we won, maybe. Yeah. Love that. Uh, and uh, Alex, what about you? Well, I've got this item here, uh, unique as well. So it's, it's a player jumper of mine from the 50 over World Cup in 2015 in India, where Lisa and I both played significant matches in that final. We won, of course. Lisa took a specky of a catch to finish the game. And it was Lisa's final game for Australia and also my 100th ODI for Australia. So a pretty special one, that one. So hopefully it gets a bit of attention. But of course, Lisa is also our newest Hall of Fame recipient for the ICC. So I think, I think this is fitting for tonight. Yeah, beautiful, awesome, awesome. Well, as it, as it always works, um, we will start the bidding and we'll run it through the first half and then we'll switch over. So item number one will be the towel from Lisa. Same as every, every month we do this, throw your bids in the chat feature here on Zoom. We'll keep you up to date. We'll also keep you timing down. Uh, and hopefully we can get those bids as high as possible. And as there seems to be every month, a little bit of a bidding warfare. We'll keep you up to date with that. If you have any questions for these guys as well, throw it in the Q&A feature in Zoom. And after Jimmy has a chat with these guys, we'll then throw all uh, of your questions or as many as we can fit to these guys as well. And already Trent Thompson, LMS Central Coast, $600 bid to start us off for the tower, which is Trent. just awesome. So thank you, Trent. Uh, and any Q&A as they go, throw them in the, throw them in the Q&A box and we'll get to them. But Jimmy, please, my friend, take it away. Cannot wait for this. Right. Well, thanks very much for, for being on the, the show tonight, Lisa and Alex. Wonderful to have two of Australia's esteemed cricketers on board. We might just do a little bit of history here. Something that keeps coming back to me about women's cricket, given where it's arrived, in recent times, is uh, every time back in the day when Belinda Clark was number one, uh, I used to say to her, what you're doing is fantastic. It's so good to see the development of the women's game. But why can't you play more often? Because Australia never played any cricket in those days. You know, they played once every six months and no one else was playing in any form of competition. So I'd just like to ask both of you about what do you think has triggered this wonderful development of cricket via the women's game and um, the impact it's had on so many lives, particularly yours, because you've both had long and distinguished careers, most of those careers without earning a cent from the game. And of, of course, uh, those that are following you are now not only enjoying the game, but... Um, making something out of it. Lisa, you're the star show at the moment. You want to kick, kick it off. What do you think has happened with women's cricket to trigger this uh, fantastic development into the game we see today? Yeah, well, well, first thing is that women's cricket has been around for a long time. Um, the fact that the first World Cup was actually a women's World Cup two years prior to the men. Um, the fact that women invented overarm bowling. Women have always played an important role but unfortunately, uh, <clears throat> probably over 100 years of discrimination simply because the amount of money um, that was being invested in the sport was predominantly to the men that were playing. So um, the reason why things have changed all of a sudden is that 
especially here in Australia, um, there are so many sports for young kids, boys and girls to, to select. Um, as Cricket Australia have boasted they want to be Australia's number one sport. And obviously cricket is certainly Australia's number one summer sport. But in order to, to kind of achieve those goals, you have to start appealing to the other half of the population. Um, and I think everyone has realised, and it's probably taken a bit of time, that women's sport is a sleeping giant. Um, and we've seen probably in the last 10 years, in women's cricket, but probably the last five years uh, across all women's codes, a huge acceleration and an appetite for it. Um, and that's why it's no surprise that on March 8, we had 86,000 people that came in to watch the T20 World Cup. But the, the, the trigger for all of that um, may have well have been the interest in the game, but in fact, it's taken a long while for the ICC to actually come to the table, and even as we speak, uh, they're not all together at the table about what's going on in the women's game. So what factors on the, you know, the periphery of administration and the rest of it have, have helped this occur? I might add a little bit there, Jim. I think um, there's been a lot of hard work for a long period of time for small gains, you know, year in, year out. And then I feel like there's been some real champions who have thought bigger in the game um, and really been creative and highly motivated to, to make a difference. And one person I think of, uh, we're both from New South Wales, uh, and Andrew Jones, former CEO of, of Cricket New South Wales, one of many male champions um, who have really promoted the game. But when, when he created this opportunity for the first female domestic team in Australia to become fully professional. He had that idea and he partnered with a like-minded sponsor in Len Lease. And so I think the sponsors were looking out for people they wanted to align with. And I think that is increasingly female athletes and women in sports who ha have traditionally been male dominated and they're breaking down barriers and stereotypes. So, Andrew Jones and Lynn Lee's partnered to create that milestone event and then other sporting groups seem to follow suit. So, you know, I think there are moments of, of brilliance and, and real significant change. And, and Lisa's be, being on the ACA as well has, has really worked hard for that from that angle as well. So Australia should be giving a itself some recognition kudos for this because hasn't Australia led the way when it comes to the, the change that has taken place like it has in, in so many areas of uh, cricket and other sports over the course of 150 years. So the backing of cr Cricket Australia in particular in getting the game to where it is now, has is that been ahead of most of the other countries in the world that have participated in uh, women's cricket? Yeah, absolutely. Australia's been leading um, by example. Uh, and, and, and even within Australian women's sports, there's a nice healthy competition. Netball comes out with a good um, pregnancy policy. Cricket Australia wants to better it. Um, remuneration goes up for AFLW or netball or the Matildas. And that really allows... Um, other sports to go, well, we don't want to lose our athletes. How do we keep them in? So there's that health, healthy rivalry. But certainly, um, I think a couple of points that probably triggered it, obviously, integration happened in the mid-2000s. Um, it, was, it was Women's Cricket Australia, um, and they integrated with Cricket Australia. Obviously, it happened at an ICC level, and then it started to happen at all national um, boards and state boards. So female players started to get better facilities, better access um, to coaches, um, better access to better playing venues, which meant the scores were better, which means it's a good product to, to watch. So that happened. I think also the female players being part of the ACA um, and, and having a voice. So as individuals who were working full-time, training full-time, um, not having any annual leave and then still fighting for certain rights, uh, it got a little bit too much and obviously the ACA came on board and we became part of them and they were able to kind of be our voice uh, to Cricket Australia. So a couple of those things have really 
um, push that. And the last thing I'd say is, um, whilst there's, like Alex said, it's important for some male champions of change, um, it's important also to have females in leadership roles, in decision-making roles. And again, we're probably biased, but from Cricket New South Wales, Christina Matthews was head of commercial. And um, I know as the Breakers team, we were celebrated just as much as the Blues. Um, and that makes a massive difference. And, and when you're in front of your, your sponsors and your, your corporate partners, um, they start seeing not one team, but two teams. Jim, I just might add one, one final thing on this. Um, you know, I think you know, CA did a, a wonderful job in putting the WBBL on for the first time without any guarantee of success, but, but they invested the money to put it on TV and create a new competition, uh, trying to be a leading domestic T20 competition for women around the world. And only once you put it on do you see the appetite for watching it. I mean, the viewership. Like we really knocked it out of the park, literally. And, and now the standard of play is increasing as the professional wave has come through as well. So you sort of have to put it out there to see what people want to watch. And women's sport is it's proven to be a success when you just look at the numbers who are watching on TV. Yeah, well, netball's going the same way, of course, uh, with professionalism of the organisation behind it and the TV exposure. Just on the look of the game, I mean, it, comparisons of odious or odorous, whatever you want to say, but um, what has the women's game done with its improved athleticism and skill uh, to make sure it does create a niche of its own and is not going to be unfairly compared to the men's game? Lisa? Now you go, Al. She's ready to go. <laughs> I, I've been recent, I don't want to let a cat out of the bag here too much, but I've been asked to put together a bit of a best 11 who I might have, you know, chosen to play, to play alongside. And I'm not going to let you know who those people are, but, um, and then who I might choose to play against as, as a second best 11, white ball cricket internationally. And a lot of those names, Jim, were pre-TV. And so I actually don't know for sure. It'd be good to see the data on this. Like, what is the difference physically? Pre-professionalism and post-professionalism or pre-TV, post-TV. Mm. I think simply the game just wasn't accessible. And so there was this preconceived idea that it wasn't entertaining. I mean, I, I must say, though, there is data around um, now that um, the, the boundaries were brought in to promote aggressive play, more sixes have been hit. And that you can track that. But if we look at how far those sixes are landing over the boundary, it was more of a, um, a style of play or an attitude that, OK, now it's high percent, percentage to go for those sixes. And we're seeing a lot more of them now. Mm. And I would argue, and, and Lisa might back me up here, she was a bowler. So, you know, I think we now need to start pushing those boundaries back. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. They need to be pushed back. And, and also, in, for, for those that don't know, in the women's T20 game, after the first six overs, only four fielders can go out. Again, to promote high-scoring affairs. Um, the game has, has certainly developed. I, I agree, Alex, that, there, that you know, I, I think we've missed out on, on seeing a Sharon Treadra, Treadray or um, a Lindsay Reeler or, you know, the, these type of players that no one has any idea of who they are, except if you're in the women's cricket uh, circle. But I've never seen any footage of those players. So um, mm. we've missed out on that sense. But one thing I can tell you is now that the players can train professionally, um, and, and I say that in the sense that they're not training before work or after work. A majority of them are training during the day. It means that they're, firstly, they're, they're getting home at a decent time and eating a proper meal. They get to recover. Um, and I think that's probably helping them manage the increase in cricket that used to happen. Now, when I first came into the Australian team, we had one series a year and it was the Rose Bowl. And every, every now and again, we'd have a game against uh, a series against England. And then in between that, there was India. So I never played any other countries outside of New Zealand, 
England and India unless we were playing a World Cup. Things have certainly changed. Um, I think probably the, the athleticism you're seeing is the fact that they can devote so much time into their bodies to get it right plus their skill level. Whereas we only had two team training sessions a week for two hours and then whatever you could do on top of that. So it's pretty much like club cricketers. Um, so it's trying to fit everything in and, and maybe it didn't allow us to be the best athletes that we could have been. Please yes, well just a reminder, nine minutes remaining uh, on the first auction item, which is the, the one of 15 uh, World Cup finals towel. So nine minutes remaining on that and then we switch over to Alex. Sorry, Jim. No worries. Um, just to be a bit analytical on that, it, it strikes me watching the women's game that whereas the, the quality of the batting and, of course, the, the bats help as they do in the men's game and the short boundaries, I mean, we're seeing some really high-class batting. But can you say that about the bowling overall? Do you think the bowling's lagged a bit in its development in the game, Alex? Well, I do think that um, it has lagged a little bit behind the batting and they've si since sort of the scores started to blow out and T20 has become the real pinnacle of women's cricket. Mm. Uh, the bowlers were forced to find new tools, um, new ways of thinking and, and a bit more resilience as well. So I definitely think that you know, if you look at the current Australian team and the difference between the 2017 50 over World Cup where we were blown out of the park from the, the, the Indian team uh, in the semi final to then the T20 World Cup subsequent to that. I think the bowling efforts have been outstanding and have really helped bag two more World Cups for Australia. Yes. Uh, and what, what about the situation of the game as you, you see it at the moment? I mean, coronavirus has mucked everybody up. Um, but it does look as though if we get a start to the Australian summer, the, the WBBL is, is going to be holding the, the forefront and getting the support that it needs. So are you happy with the, the way things are, are running towards the, the start of the season, if and when it happens? Yeah, I guess from an Australian perspective, obviously we've got the, the Rose Bowl series against New Zealand end of September where the matches will be played up um, at Allen Border Field. So that will, that will start the Australian summer and that always seems to be the case. So that's good. The WBBL will be there. I guess for me, I, I look around the world internationally and unfortunately England have been in a, a bio bubble training hard, find, trying to find an opposition and the South African government wouldn't allow their women's team to fly out. India couldn't come out because of the numbers of coronavirus there. So women's cricket is kind of lagging compared to the men's game um, in the sense of trying to, to get teams to play against each other. So um, I'm very thankful again that, that here in Australia, we're probably leading the way in, in getting women's cricket back up and running. Um, and, and rightly we should, given that we, you know, the last competitive game in this country that we really saw was a, was an outstanding one where everyone will talk about it for generations. Yeah. That was a, an, an epic show. Now, um, what about the 50-over World Cup? Uh, it, was, it was supposed to be next year, wasn't it? What's happened, what's happened with that? Now, look, I know? was a bit disappointed about that, and I don't know the details. Lisa's probably more in the know from an ICC point of view. But um, my understanding is that while New Zealand is a safe place to host and logistically, you could probably get teams there to play the tournament. To be able to qualify for the tournament, you know, the ability to play those matches leading in was, was affected. I would say that maybe there's a solution to that. You know, go off the current world rankings. Or, you know, I'd, I'd just, I'm not really happy with that decision. Um, I think it would have been fantastic to have that tournament continue. But... I'd love to hear what Lisa thinks. Yeah, you're right, Alex. It, it, it was about the ICC qualifying event, um, which was, I think, scheduled for, I want to say, August or September. Um, so three teams out of that qualifying event uh, would go on to play the World Cup. Now, given that in various countries, players haven't been able to get together to even train, um, I guess 
the ICC wanted to make it fair and even on everyone building up to a, a big event like that because not only do you progress obviously into a World Cup but also there's financial dollars that come with it when you progress to the World Cup so um, yeah I agree Alex it, it was disappointing I was hoping that they'd find a way um, um, but it, it seems that uh, they feel that it's just a little bit in the too hard basket and they want to give everyone a fair go but uh, like I said, women's cricket, and we've heard Ian Bishop as well um, speak openly about the fact that the women's game needs to keep progressing. It needs to find a way to get back on the park, similar to what the men's game was. So that means potentially you're going to have to invest a little bit more money. And, and I know money is tight for certain national boards, um, but as a collective, we need to all kind of band together and, and find solutions. Well, one of the solutions... Uh if it all happens, is in 2022, when uh, women's cricket will be played at the Commonwealth Games. And of course, in 1998, men's and uh, was it only men, men's cricket only was played at the at Commonwealth Games, that's right. South Africa beat Australia in the final, in case you forgot. Um, so what do you think that means for the development of the game, having the Commonwealth Games put women's cricket on for the first time? I think it's huge. Um, I, I'd actually forgotten how quickly that's coming around. And I'm wondering, how do they fit the 50 over World Cup in now that they've postponed that? And then you've got this, this massive uh, opportunity, women's cricket at the Com Games. Gosh, I, I know Lisa and I would have loved to do something like that. And just to be around um, the village of athletes and uh, I, you know, I think this is an opening for cricket in general. You know, the women leading a path forward to potentially bigger things, maybe Olympics one day. So I just think it's a fantastic move. Sounds like the ICC were big supporters of it. And I don't know who, which other boards were, were big supporters, but yeah, really supportive of that. Can't wait for that. Lisa? I'm, I'm glad that, that, it is probably the women's game. I always find um, uh, Commonwealth Games and Olympics, I want to see sports that you don't normally see that aren't commercially viable or it's not your, as much as we love Roger Federer, like him playing in, in an Olympics, it just kind of takes it away. But I think women's cricket, um, the sport that's been trying to kind of push through and break certain barriers to get it on that global stage will certainly help. Um, I caught up with actually Susie Bates, um, who Al knows very well, a New Zealand player who represented New Zealand in basketball as well. And I spoke to her about, you know, her experience and, and what she enjoyed. And she said, firstly, she enjoyed um, the, uh, the food hall uh, and watching all of the gymnasts go around with the smallest bowls possible. But the cricketers, I mean, sorry, the basketballers and everyone else was hoeing into the food. But then just the amount of athletes um, you know, people that you look up to and, and they, and most, most uh, Commonwealth Games athletes and Olympic athletes do it really tough financially and, and try to, you know, work really hard from a training perspective for those one percenters. So um, she was pinching herself the whole time. All right. How are we going on that auction, Matt? Oop. No. <laughs> what well, must unmute oneself in order to speak. Uh, we have 30 seconds to go. Andy's currently the top bidder. Uh, Trent, Trent, who um, has been a little sub conversation going on on the side. So Trent's now switched his bid to Alex. So the, the bidding's already started for Alex's shirt. Andy's leading uh, Lisa with 30 seconds to go, $400 for the towel. Uh, going once, going twice, unless anyone jumps in for the final bid. As soon as the clock ticks over to 8.30, bidding will close, which it has done. So congratulations, Andy. $400 for a towel. That's superb. Well done. One of 15 and all that money going direct to the primary club. So we appreciate that, which means that we opened the bidding now for Alex. Uh, $600 is where it starts. Um, but tell us again about the jumper, just to remind people, for those who may have missed it to start, what we are now bidding for. So this, this jumper is my playing jumper from the 50 over World Cup 2013. We won that final against West Indies. Lisa took the last 
catch to finish finish off the game and that finished off her career for Australia. So this is her signature here, last game for Australia. And in fact, it was my 100th ODI that day. Mm -hmm. And I joined Lisa as a, one of the, there's possibly, I don't know, about six women now. Four. Four. What? Okay. There's only four. <laughs> well, I think Pez, Pez is now up there. I, I thought so. And maybe, yeah. I don't know where Meg is, but no, there'll be more yet. to come. But yeah. Um, yeah. And Lisa is now an inductee into the International Hall of Fame. So, you know, I think this one yeah. should raise a fair bit, given I've I've snuck her on there too. <laughs> uh, well, that, that's perfect. And it does, you can shake your head as much as you want, Lisa. Just get used to the phrase Hall of Famer. Hall mm. of Famer. I know it's fresh, but it is all you'll be introduced <laughs> as for the rest of your life. Lisa, yeah. how many Australian women are in that Hall of Fame? We've got uh, Fitz, Catherine Fitzpatrick, Betty Wilson, Belinda Clark, and now you. Karen Rolton as well. Oh, and Karen, of course. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Top five. Don't, don't forget Rolts. Yeah. 20, 27th Aussie, five female, 22 male. So Jim, he knows, he knows his numbers. Up. Yes. T t just tell us about the process. Do you have to go and receive an Oscar or something? What's, what's the induct inductee business? How, how do you go about that? Well, normally, and let's, let's pretend that we aren't living in 2020 and there's a pandemic and you can't go anywhere. But normally you go to an ICC function um, award ceremony wherever it was going to. I think it might have been held in South Africa this year. Um, they fly you over in style. Um, they fly you with someone else as well. So I was looking forward to taking my father and then maybe having a little bit of a holiday afterwards. Um, but yeah, they, they have a nice award ceremony. Um, you get to obviously meet the other inductees as well, which was Jacques Callas and Zahir Abbas from Pakistan. So um, it would have been nice to have, have met those guys. But in the end, we did a, a, a lovely Zoom ceremony. I uh, had Alan Wilkins um, there who was hosting. Mel Jones was there as well. So two people that have certainly watched me play a lot as well, which was uh, really nice. Right. So does anything happen in relationship to the, the Hall of Fame at Barrel? Uh, no, completely different. Um, but don't worry, I'm sure Rena Hall will organise something. Surely Lisa's right. already on that one. Yes. Well, no, not, I'm not on that one. They've got a few amazing cricketers to go, go through. I, I mean, the thing that, that probably why I shake my head a lot about it is, is the fact that I was probably... Um, I was part of that generation where we started to play more cricket, but I, and, and I mentioned earlier, um, Sharon Treadray, who was actually um, inducted into the Australian Cricket Hall of Fame last, uh, actually beginning of this year, you know, there are so many other cricketers before me that only played a handful of games because that's all that they, that was given to them. Um, but they were amazing um, cricketers with very skillful in what they did. And, um, yeah, so I guess I'm a little bit embarrassed because I look at those players and, and what they were able to do in those situations. And um, unfortunately, their numbers don't stack up simply because they just didn't get the opportunity to play. It's interesting you talk about that because uh, you know, in men's cricket, I think most serious fans of the game would look upon test cricket as the pinnacle of the game. But in women's cricket, we've only got Australia and England playing now. I mean, New Zealand stopped playing a few years ago. Is it yeah, a dodo uh, test cricket uh, in the longer term for, for, for women? Just yeah. T20 and T50? No, nah, players want to play, Jim. They want to test themselves. They want to see what the, what the pinnacle of, of the game is and how their skills really um, are able to adjust. A, a prime example is the fact that Elisa Healy got her baggy green before Mitchell Stark. So, Jim, you can tell me the numbers of how many tests Mitchell Stark has played. Um, compared to Elisa Healy, she's still in single digits. So, you know, that just shows you the rarity of test cricket. But speaking to so many other international players, and Alex can attest to this as well, they want to play test cricket. They want to, they want to see if their skills are good enough over, and we play over four days, but we play 100 overs a day. So we only kind of lose half a day of test cricket compared to the men. But... You want to see if you're good enough. 
We're just a little bit more efficient than the men. That's why we get through those overs. <laughs> and I would say that the ultimate format for a bilateral series is what we play for the multi-format Ashes that, that we do now. Lisa and I, well, when, when I was first in the Australian team, we, we were playing two test series for the Ashes. Then it dropped to a one test series for the Ashes. I mean, that's not a series. And it was such a negative style of play in that one-off test match because whoever held the trophy didn't bother really pushing hard. So now that you've got a multi-format Ashes, so you play three ODIs, three T20s and a test match, all with weighted points per, per format, it just makes it so much more interesting. So I always advocated for, I'd love to play that format um, with the top four teams and uh, potentially... I don't know, would, would this sort of format work for men's cricket even? It's a bit controversial, but maybe for some of the um, emerging test nations, it, it's played in a, in a format like that against the top nations. Well, we've got Afghanistan coming out um, at the start of this year over at, in Perth. And obviously Ireland is a new side as well that's come into the test playing nations. But yeah, it's certainly, I think Alex, is, it has been discussed at, at that level. Um, because the discrepancy between teams wanting to come into test cricket compared to those that have been established and playing it for well over 100 years, um, they may be out of their depth. But if you, you start to put it in the multi-format, it makes it a bit more of an even competition. Yeah, and they could compete particularly on the, um, on the shorter formats um, and then develop with the test. Who knows, though, you know, these teams could could win a test match, a historic test match against Australia. Um, Is there a desire from all the other nations, of India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, South Africa, do they all want to play test cricket? Yep, the players all want to play. It's just from a board point of view as well, financially to put a four-day test match on when there is no multi-format, um, sorry, multi-day competition in domestic cricket means you're not really getting yourself ready to cope with what test cricket is. And also, instead of a four-day um, test match, you can probably put three T20s on and your broadcast numbers will go up, um, your, your actual uh, spectators coming into the game because T20 is the exciting format. They'll come in and watch it with their thousands. But we had the day-night test um, back in 2017, was it, Al? And... Um, we had 12,500 come in over the course of um, at North Sydney Oval mm. and that was the first one of its kind for women's cricket. So you've got to give it time to develop. You've got to give the players time to develop as well to make it an attractive format as well. But when they don't ever play anything longer than a 50 over game, um, it, it, it is quite a huge adjustment. So we need more former women cricketers in positions of influence. So are either of you, or as a Christina Matthews, who's running for the job at Cricket Australia? There's a vacancy there. Who's putting up their hand? Well, I thought you would know, Jim. You tend to be all over this. Um, well, I did have an inkling that James Sutherland was going to get the golf job, but um, um, I, I don't know much about what's happening with the with, with the with a cricket job at, at this stage, but I'm sure it's going to be a very well-paid position. And that should be one of the reasons for any number of uh, women who are involved. Christina Matthews comes to mind because she's in the mix, but uh, there must be others around who have got some uh, ability as organisers and the rest of it and have played cricket. Who, who else could put up their hand for that job? Well, we, we've been saying, I think, for a long time, Belinda Clark should do it, but I don't think she wants to do it either. She doesn't either. want to do it. No. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's the issue. Obviously, Christina Matthews went for the role uh, when Kevin Roberts got it, and, and um, I think she was the final, went down, came down to the final three. Um, at the moment, Nick Cockley, who um, is a C, was the CEO of the T20 World Cup, um, has, is, has got the interim role, and, and obviously he did a wonderful job for the T Women's T20 World Cup, it's a shame that we didn't get to see what he had put in place uh, for the men's tournament, which was to take place this year in October, November. But, um, yeah, I think obviously there's been a lot of changes at Cricket Australia. A lot of senior senior management team have left. So 
Uh, it's all about and people trying to and organisations trying to find ways of coping in this unprecedented times as well. Alex, you want to put your hand up? You're on the board at New South Wales. <laughs> I like where I am at the moment, Jim, learning a whole lot. Now not being on the field, being off the field, learning the business of the game. And, you know, I think I can contribute there and I've still got a lot to learn. I, you know, I, I agree. I think those two women you've mentioned, Chris Matthews, Belinda Clark, they could do it for sure and do a fantastic job. There could be women outside of cricket who, who could do the job as well. Um, but, you know, I, I would imagine it's someone who's going to be from within the game but I think, you know, what, one thing I'm quite focused on is women in coaching roles. Mm -hmm. and I just don't think we're developing enough um, female coaches. And, and you see that across all our national teams. No disrespect to the, to the people leading those teams at the moment, but there is such a low representation of women leading our national female teams. Um, you know, I think we can do better there. Uh, just on the de development of the game, what are the ongoing barriers for women to, to knock over uh, to keep the game developing, other than the fact that there's so much choice when it comes to sport these days? What else has to happen to make it easier for young women uh, to make it as professional cricketers? Lisa? It's, it comes down to investment. Um, the more you invest, the more you can put programs, pathways, um, create more opportunities for young girls to, to take up cricket. Um, our domestic players are still not professional players. They're semi-professional players. Um, some of them are still working, uh, so they're still not able to put enough time into the game. But also the amount of cricket that they're playing um, is not enough. Uh, they're playing probably, uh, you know, too few of 50 over matches, which really, I think, gives players a chance to develop the game. Um, so things need to, to improve in, in that area. And I think probably domestic cricket um, is, is the big area, not only here in this country, but also across the border, around, around the world. All countries need to start uh, investing more money in domestic cricket. Yeah, I agree with that, Lisa. Domestic cricket is a real key. Um, to ensure that that gulf between sort of the top nations and, and the, the weaker nations doesn't sort of blow out. And I think it would be wonderful, Jim, to see it, the equivalent of a Shane Watson or a Dan Christian in the women's, in the women's game. You know, players who can be um, professional T20 players all around the world. You know, we don't have those equal opportunities for women at this point in time. Will we have an IPL? Will we have a Caribbean league? Will there be a different league altogether, something brand new? Um, those opportunities don't exist yet. Are you confident they will? I think so, because it's proven to be a product that people are interested in. Um, and I think um, there's opportunity with the women's game to create something new and novel. And I think the women might jump on board with that because, you know, th their opportunities are so limited at the moment. You might be able to create a really interesting product for the viewers back home that, um, you know, it's, it's all about what the players are willing to agree to. You know, we've seen, you know, Lisa interviews Elisa Healy wicket keeping or actually there was a game where Elisa Healy and I were both mic'd up as batters and we were sort of talking like walkie-talkies. You know, are we going to see coaches being, being able to communicate with the captain? Uh, things like that. Like, I think there's innovation that could possibly occur um, more readily in the women's game because it's still quite underdeveloped from a commercial point of view. Jim, I'm, um, I'm conscious of the time because... Yeah, okay. Uh, I know question, we've question. asked the, uh, these... these uh, two fantastic contributors to stick around for an hour, yep. and I know that you know we might be able to massage that a little bit longer. But um, uh, the current bidding, by the way, eight hundred dollars uh, with Trent. Now Trent uh, is from Last Woman Stands, uh, the league on the Central Coast, which is currently the only active LWS league in the world as it stands, according to Trent. Which is unbelievable. Mm. Have either of you guys played Last Woman Stands? 
Yeah. No, I Not played me. last man's dance. Trent's a teammate <laughs> of mine. Played in the primary club team. Nathan <laughs> as well back there. So um, actually, I absolutely loved my time with last man's stands. It was my preparation for my final WBBL series. Uh, I wasn't playing any other cricket. So um, thanks to those guys, I actually had a pretty good final series for the Thunder. Um, well done, Trent, the, mm. getting the women playing up in Newcastle. I think there's actually a really great social women's um, competition uh, running up there. So well done. Yeah. Nath also asked, how did the primary club T20 team compare to the WBBL? Alex, <laughs> feel free to be honest. Look, if I had one comment for last man stands, I would say improve the ball. Like that, that orange thing, it's so rock hard. And I, I get it. You want it to last a bit longer so you don't have to go through all those cricket balls. But um, I reckon I broke my bat um, playing against that rock. Um, <laughs> But, yeah, it was... I was going to say, I want to know by, uh, by uh, Alex's teammates, was she, was she intense as she always is? Was she yelling as loud as she could when she was running between the wickets? Because it, it, she was, whenever she was running between the wickets, you were never confused. It was almost like she was anticipating the 86,000 people. I was like, Al, we're only in front of Christine. I was just getting ready for it. <laughs> That's the so... worst. You get run out and just because you didn't hear it, so... No doubt. <laughs> uh, okay, so there's, there's a number of questions that operate on a, on a similar theme. So I reckon we can sort of um, tie a few of them in together. Um, for example, Katrina asked, how can I best support my daughter who's interested in entering a typically male-dominated sport as opposed to something more traditionally girly like netball? Uh, there's another question from Gordon. Um, you both attended the same school, which is also Gordon's alma mater. Um, can you see girls playing in the first 11 much like uh, Alicia did competing successfully against the boys. There's this sort of this broader theme around is it a boys sport, <laughs> girls sport or whatnot. Yeah, what, for, from two people who have not only done it but broken through and now made themselves household names in Australia as cricketers, how do you approach this whole conversation? Basically, um, there are so many more opportunities now compared to when Alex and I first picked up the bat and ball. Um, there's junior girls competitions throughout uh, New South Wales, and if you go on um, the website playcricket.com.au, I think it is, uh, you type in your, your uh, postcode and it comes up with all your local uh, cricket clubs and there'll be girls clubs, girls competitions. So um, if your daughter is just taking up the game, that's probably the best place to start her off because it's not as daunting as it is to play with the boys. But if she's her skill level is good enough to cope with the young guys, I say let her play as long as she's getting an opportunity to bat or bowl um, because that will help develop her cricket a lot faster. Um, and you look even now in the current Australian women's side, they've all come through playing boys cricket. Um, don't worry, you've got your whole lifetime to play with women. You don't need to do it from the age of 10 unless, unless you're not getting an opportunity. I, I would say that I reckon the kids these days don't care. It's probably the parents who still have that hang up around what are boys supposed to be doing when they're young and what are girls supposed to be doing when they're young. So uh, I reckon, and my mum would, would agree with this, sometimes it's the parents' attitude that is the hardest to deal with. I know, you know, playing boys cricket in the country, I had my twin sister, Kate. You know, Lisa, you had a really um, supportive dad. You know, I think you really needed those allies back then, but it's just so commonplace now. It's regular on the TV, um, you know, and little boys should be able to play whatever sport they want to play too, um, you know, whether that be netball or jazz ballet. So I think my message to parents would be just allow many opportunities for your kid and they'll tend to choose what they like um, and just, you know, support them in that. So being on the TV is amazing. My little nephew, who is cricket nuts, six is mad. He doesn't care whether he's watching the men, bang on, the men <laughs> or the women's games. It's just cricket on TV. He sits glued to the TV. He'll then go to um, North Sydney Oval or go to Jermoyne or go to the SCG. He doesn't care. They're just the people he's seen on TV. That's the change that we're seeing. Um, which then goes to uh, a question about the cricket that we've watched. 
playing in front of 86,000 people. Do you think about it every day? This is a question from Luke. Um, what was it like and uh, can you put it in words? Well, we didn't play against uh, in front of 86. I think for Alex and I, our biggest one was maybe 25,000 at the MCG, um, the first yep. T20 double header. I was um, even thinking that the match at Varpi, where Varpy. I don't think they were ca counting the entrance. Um, some of them were scaling up onto the hillside nearby. Um, they were all men, I think, <laughs> at this sort of small village of 2 million people in, in India. <laughs> um, <laughs> That was 2004, so you know, yeah, it was. there was we did play in front of crowds, but they were not on our side. Um, <laughs> Twenty-five thousand at the MCG. That was 2008, I think, Lise, and you know, a groundbreaking moment. It was a double header. We played before the men's game, Australia, India. I think the men played, and we played England. Ours was a much better game, much better contest, um, and I think the 25,000 who turned up early got real good value for their money because the men's game was an absolute flop after us. But it, all, it was also um, Elise Perry's debut match um, for T20 cricket. And uh, obviously now she's, she's really the face of women's cricket. Uh, I think the Indian men's team, I think they were bowled out for 75 or something like that. Yeah. We, we smashed them. I think Everybody it's a really got. great contrast because we needed the double headers at that early stage of T20 cricket for women. Um, it's, it's just a no-brainer now that it needs its own free air to thrive. And look what can happen when the right motivation and investment's behind it. A full house at the MCG. You know, I think it puts pressure on a lot of other sports to think bigger around their female teams and what's possible. Well, this is, this is a, a, from Mark in a similar vein, uh, although I think I know what your answer is. But we, uh, we play women's T20s uh, prior to the men's in certain capacities why can't we play a women's test during the day and then the men's test at night in Adelaide other than the pitch which may be an issue but is that a possibility so is, is that a suggestion around like a merged game like the women's no no, 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 no. Okay. it's like a double so header imagine imagine that RSA in Adelaide there's none people would just crawl out of that venue <laughs> driving at 10 and leaving at 10 um uh, I don't know what time yeah. we'd have to start for that for that to happen. Yeah. <laughs> do you, yeah. do you want to be calling um, from like six a.m. till ten p.m.? No, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's going to work. Mean? Not for um, te not test cricket. <laughs> um, Jeffrey, no, I, I think Alex, Alex has made the point that uh, women's cricket's got its own identity, so it it doesn't need yeah. to to have a double header anymore. Um, okay. It's own double header, but not with men. Yeah, yeah. Okay, this one is from, um, where is it? Uh, oh, it's from Anonymous, attendee. Okay. Um, says, we always hear about um, men's sledging on the, ga on the ground and whatnot is always such a deal. Women cricketers seem far more polite. However, is there sledging on the field in men's cricket? And if so, what's the best sledging you've heard? In women's cricket, yeah. Oh, I always Where's get Alyssa Healy? She could be here. I always get this question, and I just feel such a disappointment with my answer. There is sledging, but I can't think of any good ones. That, but um, I remember Kate and I were <laughs> under the lid at a test match at Hove, and we were just pretending to be like this stereo effect because we sound exactly the same trying to put off the, the opposition batter, I think Laura Marsh in particular at the time. But you know, I think the, the best ledger for me in my time was Elisa Healy. And she didn't even hold back sledging against <laughs> the city country team. I'm captain of country, she's in the city team and she's the wicket keeper. I'm captain of the New South Wales team. She didn't hold back. So um, yeah, she's pretty talented at that. I, I played. I probably played in a different era, um, and so it was before t TV, which is probably a good thing. But there, there were some feisty characters um, when I first came into state cricket. Um, the the sledges, um, they don't. I don't think they get too personal, but they're really witty, cleverly thought out, and kind of really funny as well. Um, but the best sledge that I 
heard, it was two, so it's New South Wales versus Victoria. Firstly, we can't stand each other. Hmm. Um, and so you've got two players who have played for their country together, but obviously play against each other. Uh, can't stand each other, don't want to talk to each other, nothing. So one of them is bowling to the other. The batter hits the ball back, back to the bowler. Bowler picks it up and bowler stares at the batter, as they all do. And the batter goes, what are you looking at? And before you know it, the bowler's just turned around and gone, I don't know, I don't have my animal, animal book with me. And it's like, oh, I can't believe you just said that. Um, so everyone else in the field is giggling and obviously the batter had nothing to come back with, like very quick-witted. Um, but that's probably the funniest sledge I've heard. Um, the other one is Elise Perry uh, is terrible at sledging. Uh, it was the Bankstown Test Match, Al, um, and we were huddled around Isha, uh, Isha Gua, who was batting, who obviously everyone knows now from broadcasting, and she had some kind of pink grip or... She had some kind of weird pads or something like that. And Pez starts to kind of try and think of funny things like talking about Libra Fleur tampons or pads or something like that. In the end, Elisa Healy said, mate, shut up. Go back out. You're embarrassing us. Let us sledge properly. So, um, you know, some people tried. Um, I wasn't one for sledging. Or I thought I wasn't quick enough or funny enough. I just uh, let actions do the talking. Great. Um, on, a, on a similar vein, this one from Kritika. She's actually the first person to ask a question. She was pumped for this on Twitter, I noticed, during the day. Uh, congratulations, Lisa, and here is a question. Uh, you said in a recent interview that you were slash are terrified by Clark, your first captain. Can you share the incident which led to that being the case? Everything that she ever does. <laughs> um, oh, look, I think Belinda Clark was you know, someone that you looked up to, not only for her skill level, but her leadership. Um, I walked into the New South Wales team. I was 18 years of age, just finished high school. Um, and back then you don't speak in team meetings. You never say anything, you just listen. But I remember walking in um, and I must have had thongs on or something. And uh, she said, are you wearing nail polish? And I was like, yeah. And she kind of absolutely rolled her eyes. I was like, Right, never, never uh, wearing nail polish again. Obviously, Skipper doesn't like it. Um, but she was such a fierce competitor. Um, she asked a lot of you as players, which made you better. Um, but I had seen a lot of players kind of fall by the wayside. But her expectations on herself and her teammates was really hard. And, and she was quite happy to, to pull you up if, if she saw that things weren't right or you were taking shortcuts. So um, she was a hard taskmaster. So that's why still to this day, when I see Belinda, I'm like, hi, Belinda, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> um, Alex, uh, okay, this one from Martin, you can go first. Same question um, that was asked to Damien Fleming and Sean Marsh last session. Worst teammate to share a room with? Mm. Easily, Meg Lanning. Why? Um, we don't share rooms anymore or you know I'm, I'm retired I shouldn't say that um, I was fortunate enough to play long enough for those conditions to change and we we did finally get our own rooms um, but Meg Lanning so messy and like is this organized mess she sort of as soon as you get into the room she sort of everything's out of the bat out of the suitcase and they're all sort of organized in these very neat sort of packages of plastic bags that have each of the items like shirts or socks or whatever and by the end of a you know a couple of days stay at this hotel it's everywhere um so yeah easily meg lanning just for the mess lisa you got a favorite favorite teammate no, say the worst teammate <laughs> <laughs> um uh, to be honest i reckon julie hunter Oh, yeah. um, she she didn't sleep well um, and uh, we were staying um, uh, in the Caribbean for the T20 World Cup 2010 and she wasn't sleeping very well but she'd have her phone under her blankets and it's like I can still hear you like you're still keeping oh, me up phone, wasn't it? at least with yeah. the like the clicky button oh, it's like did my head in and then a couple of oh, there was one time actually um, 
I was like looking at the time going, we're late. We, I think we had an anti-corruption um, seminar or something, uh, induction. And I'm going, Jules, we're late. We're absolutely late. She goes, no, nah, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. And it's like, you don't want to leave your teammate. So I waited. In the end, Catherine Fitzpatrick came and met us out and, and said, right, you two are late. You get in there and you apologise to ICC and... We had to kind of, you know, head down. Sorry, everyone. We really appreciate it. Oh, we got an absolute rollicking for it. And I thought, stuff, Julie Hunter. I'm not waiting for her any- again. <laughs> Amazing. Awesome. I love this stuff. Um, okay, so briefly, um, we've hit nine o'clock. Uh, as a couple of people have been battling it out for the beard, we'll give it a couple more moments, but we are about to close it. Katrina currently leads at $850, uh, mm-hmm. but we'll hold it for another couple of minutes your chance to, to make a bid and then we're going to close it for Alex's jumper whilst we get to a couple more quick, uh, questions very briefly. Um, there is a few questions around whether or not, and I think you sort of have both sort of answered it in a separate way. Do you ever see a time where men and women would play in the same team or a woman would be picked to play in the men's team? Um, I guess all vice versa. But is that even something that you would want to happen or is it now separating? And if so, could it happen? My last effort in, in cricket was um, playing in the Bushfire 11. And um, it was Brett Lee bowling, Yuvraj Singh batting, sky ball. I took a catch on the boundary. So, I mean, I've, we've Stop both that. played um, cricket with, with boys and men. Um, I, I don't really want to see that necessarily. Um, don't think we need it. But I do acknowledge um, Steve Waugh. He, he always, uh, at the Steve Waugh and Belinda Clark medal night, he would often be interviewed at the end and have these quite interesting ideas, like a bit out there sometimes. And one of them was, well, I think um, in the BBL teams, there should be a, a female player in each team. And this was before the WBBL. Um, and, I, you know, he was quite serious about that. And, and I think that says he believed the skill level um, is good enough to be able to have a player, you know, picked in, in these teams. But you know, I didn't really agree with the, the idea, but I liked that he saw the skill level as, you know, being able to shape up. I think uh, if there's a player that's good enough to play, then so be it. Uh, I've spoken to Simon Kadich, who at the time was uh, the Kolkata Knight Riders head coach in the IPL. And we were talking about if they're, especially in India, if there's a mystery spinner, spinners are, you know, whilst everyone thought T20 cricket would be the death of spinners, um, especially in the subcontinent, the slower wickets, if you're able to turn the ball, take the pace off, you can be really effective. So he, he was actually kind of talking to me about, do you reckon we could find, you know, an amazing spinner out in rural India, a young girl who could be able to obviously cope from a fielding perspective and and bat probably 10 or 11. But if they're good enough, if you find someone that's good enough, I don't see why not. But I don't think it needs to happen. I don't think there needs to be a rule um, that a female player has to be in the men's side. Like I said, if they're good enough, go for it. Sure. Um, last chance, Trent, we're looking for you. Last woman stands uh, ambassador here from the Central Coast. This is your last chance to be there. We'll close it and send it to Katrina. Um, uh, last couple of questions as well. Uh, uh, Jeffrey Verko, uh, Lisa, would like to know what red wine you're currently drinking, by the way. <laughs> oh, it's really good, guys. <laughs> yeah, it's very good. Yeah. Uh, the Kunawara Cab Sab. Yep, beautiful. The 2017, a delightful drop. Wow, wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> very good uh, uh, and, uh, and Alex uh, for you um, last question here um, uh, well there's a few people that ask a similar thing can you or either of you be enticed back to play a, one more or two seasons in the WBBL can it be done no. Ooh, could it be done no nah. Like, I've actually made this decision. I'm not even coming back. Sorry, guys, for the primary club, last man stands. I'm done. I, I don't even want to go out and play a charity game because I, can't, I don't feel I can beat that last moment. Okay, Brett, I, did I tell you? I think I mentioned <laughs> Brett Lee Bowling, you French Skyball, Blackwell takes a catch at long off, comes in and does a 
a high 10 to Brian Lara. I mean, do I really want to spoil that? I mean, Nathan Ray coming off the short run. I mean, I don't know why. That doesn't necessarily do it for you. Uh, Lisa, any chance? No chance. Uh, this is the thing. I, I think this is the difference between male and female players. You boys love to still get out in your whites and, you know, have your beer afterwards and talk about the old days and feel like you're still running off the long run. But I couldn't think of anything worse. Um, <laughs> and there are times that I've been asked and primary club has asked me as well, Lisa, can you come play a game? I'll say, I'll coach or I'll commentate or I'll umpire. <laughs> That's about fair. it. Fair, 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 fair. All right, now I need a, a team decision, and uh, Jim, you can weigh in as well how we want to play this. So, so Katrina had the last bit at 850. Trent then swooped in with 851. Now that to cool. me feels pretty low ball sort of snipery. Um, so there's, there's two ways we got this thing uh, moving, didn't he? Uh, and to his credit, uh, so he is the highest bidder. Um, is there? Yeah. Uh, are you happy with 851? I mean, Alex, this is your this is your item. Um, are you happy with a one dollar come over the top bid at the end, or does Katrina get it for having the honourable 850 dollar bid? Or option three, do you have something? Do you have something else that we can throw to Katrina? Uh, another item. I I know this fairness of what you've got, but something that we can offer Katrina and Trent, and they can both walk away happy, and the primary club can walk away with an extra eight hundred and fifty. So something worth eight hundred and fifty. Can I find be, Katrina? Has to be a like for like. Can can I can I get your short sleeve jumper out from that game? <laughs> <laughs> This happened to Pat Cummins on the first night that we did this. Uh, there were two people go, go, going for it. So he, he initially had a pair of Ashes boots and then he came up with a shirt. So both, I think uh, I can both find were in, in the mix, you know. I can find like for like with this. You can? So if, if Katrina would like to trust me on that, Oh, I can, Katrina, do I you want to trust Alex? Be disappointed. Big. Um, well, Katrina, if if you can write in the chat um, that you are comfortable with trusting Alex, we'll do a like for like for your eight hundred and fifty. And Trent stitched himself up during that by saying he can go to nine hundred. So you've locked in the jumper at nine hundred, Trent, and we're looking for an eight hundred and fifty dollar <laughs> item uh, for Alex, which is perfect. So thank you, Trent. That's amazing bidding as well. Thank you, uh, Andy, for, for the towel from Lisa and Katrina. Just confirm and we'll send you an $850 like for like item. It's locked. Matt, she's, she's confirmed. She's confirmed. How good. Trust that's, me. Oh, that's that amazing. wonderful. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Very thank you so much. Very thank gym. you so much for coming and being a part of this. It's no me. worries. Yeah. The next one, Jimmy, is Egg Cowan, another one of your ABC broadcast colleagues. And the grey cricketers. Are, are you familiar with the grey cricketers, Jim? Um, I yeah, I, I met I met them some time ago. We did an interview somewhere. I can't <laughs> can't remember all the bits and pieces, but they're a, a cheeky lot. They love their cricket, so it's always good to have a bit of fun with people. And they can uh, play up to it. Uh, yeah, sure. yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, amazing, Lisa, to get your time so fresh after the the Hall of Fame announcement. Thank you so much for being a part of it obviously a primary club ambassador, and Alex as well. Thank you so much for joining us this evening also. Thank you. No worries. Thanks thank for having you. us. Thank you, Matt. We'll see you guys thank next time. And a big you. thank you to Vocus Communications and Equinix, uh, yes. as well as to those who won the auctions. We'll see you in a month's time for the latest of our monthly webinar series. See you guys. Have a great day. See ya. Bye. Bye, Bye Jimmy.